I had an opportunity myself to go on a mission trip years ago, many years ago, to the Philippines. It was my first trip. And it really had an impact on my life. How many of you have ever been on a missions trip? Raise your hand. Yeah, quite a few. And it, and it changed my life. And I know that's why we're all here. The, the people that are here today, you have a stirring going on in your heart to even want to be here at a missions conference. And, and, you, and you want to be used of the Lord. And that's what God wants to do with us and even as Pastor David was sharing about, you know, praying that we're all to pray and look for God's open door, look for God's leading when it comes to these missions trips. What does God want me to do? What does he want you to do? And so there's an opportunity, a number of them that come up through uh, Calvary Chapel Clayton, but uh, we have a missionary family that we have been supporting for quite a few years in Honduras. And uh, we're planning on taking a missions trip there uh, to Honduras this August. And I want to give an invitation to anyone here that would like to come along. Um, maybe God hasn't directed you towards Honduras, but this would be a good opportunity uh, for you to be able to come along and for us to get together, you know, whatever churches are, to come together and to go minister together. And so we have this trip uh, coming up in August, uh, the 3rd through the 10th. Uh, the cost is approximately $2,000. What will change that, and I believe there's a possibility, hopefully we can get it lower, will be the airfare. We know what the country costs are, but $2,000. And uh, you can go to the website, and you can go um, on a commissioned website, and there's a place on there where you can actually register for that or place an interest uh, in going on this trip. And so pray about it and see how the Lord might, uh, might lead you in that. And so let's, uh, let's open in prayer. Father, I thank you uh, for this time together uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we're here today, Lord, to lift you up. Lord, to, to glorify you, uh, to raise your name on high. That's why we're here. It's what we're all about. It's about you. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless, Lord, this time as we open up your word once again. Lord, that you would speak your truth into our heart, that we would be exhorted, that we'd be encouraged, that we'd be challenged by you and by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title or the theme for this uh, conference is shine. And I shared last year, this is uh, I think my third time being here, but I shared last year, the last year's theme was commissioned. It's the, it's the name of that website, it commissioned, and it was the missionary lifestyle. I love those words, the missionary lifestyle. It's really what we should try to take on as Christians. What is my life about? You know, every day when I get up, I, we're to be a missionary, really. And it's a lifestyle. It's a way of thinking that we would take on. I use this uh, acronym uh, when I taught, uh, and it's the word power. It's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Most of us know that scripture, that you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in both Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Power. That, that P there stands for our personal testimony. You know, I, uh, having that long version that you could write out on a piece of paper of everything that led to you coming to Christ. And then you've got your short version. You, you have an opportunity to open your mouth for Christ. And you got your short version where you're just verbally telling somebody. It's important for you to know. Write out your testimony and, and get it in your head. Paul used it all the time. He'd go out and he'd preach the gospel. And he would always share his testimony because it's powerful. It's a changed life. The O is for opportunity. Living a missionary lifestyle. 
as a Christian. The W is for witness, which is our lifestyle and also our words. How we live as Christians has a big impact on what we say and who will listen to us. The letter E is for effective witnessing. And, and, and I believe that just is being empowered and led by God's Holy Spirit. Effective witnessing apart from the Holy Spirit, nothing there. We need God's power. We need him to empower us and to lead us to those individuals that we would come in contact with on a missions trip. God, would you lead me? Uh, R is for ready. And it's being ready for those divine encounters. Uh, last year, I shared a lot about divine encounters for those of you that were here. And I, and I really look at those opportunities that God puts before us, that he is actually directing our footsteps. Do you believe that? That God actually orders your steps. He puts people in your path that are hungry, that want to that wanna hear. And so power. Just remember that word. But how many of us here today are full-time missionaries that are serving in the mission field, some foreign land? Raise your hand. No. One, one person. Missionaries in a foreign land. What about the rest of us? We're at a missions conference here today. We're not all going to be called to a foreign mission land. But does that mean that we're not missionaries? No, we're, we're, we're all missionaries in our own right. Webster's Dictionary defines a missionary as a person who undertakes a mission, especially a religious mission. It's somebody being sent out into the mission field. That's a, that's a missionary. We're all here today for a missions conference. We've been planning for it. Kevin's been planning for it. This church has been planning. And we've been planning to come for this missions conference. But you know, not all missions conferences are the same. If we had this room full of uh, career missionaries that have been serving out in the field and they're back here on furlough and they're gathering together, uh, then those that, were, that are speaking... They would know their audience and they would tailor what they are going to share with that audience, possibly in a different way than what you're hearing at this conference. But they're all missions conferences. Pastor Kevin and I, we speak quite often. We've spoke about this conference. We talked about it. And... Uh, Kevin just pretty much leaves it up to the speaker. What, you know, what is the Lord leading you to share with the people? And so I have to sit there and, and you know, we, you have to wrestle as a pal. You're thinking about what is it that, God, that you want me to speak? What do you want me to say? And obviously the, the, the title is Shine. And, and, it, and I think it's a great word for us as Christians. But it's important for me as a pastor or as a teacher to know my audience. Who do we have here today? Well, we have a lot of Christians here that I know are in love with Jesus Christ. I heard it in your worship. And, and we're here and we're gathered together. And so when I started thinking in my mind, what would I want to share with this audience is about your personal mission. I want you to think individually, your personal mission, your personal witness as a Christian. Bring it down to yourself. It's been said that all Christians are in full-time ministry. But being in a full-time ministry really has nothing to do with you being on staff at a church or getting a paycheck. It has nothing to do with that. We're all in full-time uh, ministry. But I believe that we are also all called as Christians to be full-time missionaries. Think, well, I'm not you know, a missionary. You know, I go to work every day. 
I do this, I do that. We're all called to be full-time missionaries for the Lord. The theme of this conference is shine, and it's taken from Matthew 5.16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let me ask you, where is your mission field to shine individually? Where is your mission field? How many uh, people do we have here are in construction? There's a mission field. Oh, yeah, yeah, we got one here. Uh, how many of you work in a warehouse situation? Oh, wow, what, do we, what do you all do? Okay, we got, we got one guy here. Okay, well, let's bring this down. How many students do we have in this room? Raise your hand. Students, yes. Okay. How many uh, university, college, university? Okay. Any military, police, fire? Anybody? Yeah, okay, we got that here. How many caregivers? Nurses. Okay, we got a few of those. You know, how many uh, just stay-home moms? Any of those? Wow, there we go. <laughs> Got some stay-home moms that are here. Homeschoolers? Yeah, yeah, a lot of homeschoolers. There's, uh, uh, how many mission fields are represented here? A lot. A lot of mission fields. A lot of individuals in different places being scattered around. The Lord has you in that particular place. And you're a full-time missionary. The question is, how is it that we shine like lights in our mission field? Where is your mission field? Do you see it as a mission field? Do you see your neighborhood as a mission field? Do you see the, the warehouse that you work at or the hospital that you're, the school that you go to as a mission field? It's important for us to see it that way. It's the missionary lifestyle that we should all be taking on. This whole word commissioned, I think it'd make a great title for a website, don't you? <laughs> I, I, I guess it is. It, it already is. Okay, you know what? But commissioned, we've all been commissioned. So what was Jesus' mission and coming into this world. Why did he come? Why was he, in a sense, commissioned by the Father to this earth? Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's his mission. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul said this. He said, This is a faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's why he came. It, 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 that was his mission. It was his goal to go to that cross for the, the sins of the world. We need to know as Christians that we have, and all of us have, a part we all have a role, we all have a part in accomplishing the task of missions. Most of us will never be called to a foreign land. That's not what God has for you. But you still can see yourself in the role of accomplishing missions. And I, and I believe that's what happens here at Calvary Chapel Clayton. I know Pastor Kevin I've known other pastors that weren't so much into missions, but it's where my heart is. It's where Pastor Kevin's heart is. And I, and I believe the pastors that are represented are here. It is. We know that we're called to get the gospel out, to make disciples, where we've been commissioned by God, by the sheer fact that you're a believer. As a pastor of the church that God has put into my care, I teach them. I care for them. It's, it's, it's part of the role of a pastor. 
but I also encourage the people in our church. I exhort the people in our church to get outside the walls. Here's this front row right here. I'm glad you all sat right up front here today. That's, that's good. These are all people in our church. But I exhort them to get outside the walls. And I believe that it's a healthy thing for every church. You don't want to, we don't want to just sit in here. You know, we come in here to get fed, to get taught, to get built up, to go out and to be those missionaries and to live that missionary lifestyle. But you know, most of us that have been a Christian for a while, we know that it's a healthy thing when you come to church and you take in, but then you're willing and ready to give out, right? Uh, take in and give out. If you're a church that's only taking in and your sponge is sitting out there, taking it in week after week and never giving it out, I, I'll tell you this, if you haven't already experienced it or you're experiencing it now, you'll get dry. It'll get old. It'll get stale. It won't seem so exciting as it did a few years ago or when you gave your life to Christ. It's kind of getting a little bit old. And, and it's probably because you're not giving out. You're not a, a vessel that the Holy Spirit is working through and you're seeing God working. The things that you're taking in, you're giving out. And the more you give out, the more you want to take in. You'll actually hunger for more. You'll want more. Your heart will be stirred more. I believe it's a healthy thing for every church to be a church that is wanting to reach out, to have a missionary lifestyle mindset. We all have a Jerusalem, don't we? You should be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And most of us will never go to a foreign land. But we all have a Jerusalem. It's those places that you work. It's those homes that you're in. Those neighbors that you have. That goes to everyone here. Young down to, to the old to the young. All of us. It's, it, it's incredible how God takes these vessels and says, you know what? I'm going to just use you. You're just, you're just a clay pot. But, I, but I'm going to use you in incredible ways. Isn't that amazing? Calvary Chapel Fellowship of Winston-Salem has its own Jerusalem. Calvary Chapel Clayton has its Jerusalem here. And, and, and it's around us, right here. Here's your Jerusalem, Clayton, right here. Just look out and go out. That's your Jerusalem. Each church that is represented here today has their Jerusalem, right where they're at. And it's up to us to first start in our Jerusalem, and then God will then begin to expand vision out to Judea, out to Samaria, and then and to the uttermost parts of the world. And you'll see those things working within the church. Each church should be seeking the Lord on how they can reach out more and more. Not do it in our own flesh and our own, you know, but how can we impact our Jerusalem in a greater way? How can we as a church be involved in foreign missions? How can we send out missionaries and support them through prayer and finances? How can we support them even if we're not going. See, a, a healthy church is a church that's involved in missions. I would say that that would hit my list if I was looking for a church. Is this church involved in any way outside these walls? If it's not, that's probably not the church for me. Even if they're teaching the word. It needs to be a church that has a flow that is going out of it. I was in the country of Wales with my family for six years. We are full-time missionaries being supported financially by a, a number of different 
Calvary chapels, uh, and, and we were involved in planting two Calvary chapels there in those six years. During that time, I, I led and, and put together teams that would come from the United States over to the UK to help and assist us in planting these churches from the ground up. And I would organize and plan all the outreach and all the in-country uh, details. I would put all those things together. In those six years, we had over 800 people come from nine different Calvary chapels here in the States in six years. You know how exciting that is? You know how many people I saw come? on? We had one team that was 72 people that came to Wales. What, you know, we, we're just filling up a plane. It, it, can you imagine that? And, and, and how exciting it is to see these Christians just come with anticipation of what God's going to do. And the work that God did through these short-term missions. I'm all about short-term missions. Some people that are long-term mission, go, well, these short-termers don't know what they're talking about. But it's exciting to see what God does in the heart of a person that just says, God, I want to go out and just be used of you. It's really one of the things that has connected my heart with Pastor Kevin's heart because we really, in a lot of ways, we think the same way. We're both missions-minded. We're both about outreach. We've ministered together. We've been to the mission field ourselves, taught alongside each other and been involved, in, in, and it's, it's great. That's what we want to do through this commission website is to be able to see the Calvary chapels connect at that level, to come alongside one another. In our Jerusalem there in Winston-Salem, God made it real easy for me as a pastor. You know how he did that? He says, uh, 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 I'm going to give you a church building. And he literally gave us a ch church building. And he planted us right in a place in Winston-Salem that's kind of a rough area. Here's your building. Here's your Jerusalem. And what are you going to say to me if I just give you the building? Because you see, in my mind, I could go, well, maybe we don't want to have our church building there. But no, that's where I want you, and I'll give it to you to show you that. So here's your building. You don't have to think about where your Jerusalem is. We got a busy street that runs right in front of the church, and then we got a whole neighborhood of houses all around. There's your Jerusalem. What are you going to do with it? That's what we have here, Calvary Chapel Clayton, and every other church that is represented here. Some of the ways that we are currently, in our church anyway, reaching outside the walls is we have a ministry that's called that, Outside the Walls. And we have a group of people that go out on Sunday after church and they go out witnessing and handing out bread through our bread ministry. And God's using them. I go out off and on with them with this team after church. We have this bread of life ministry where we go to Harris Teeter. They give us all this bread that's getting ready to go off code. We got a whole table in our foyer just loaded with bread that people can take. But you know what the encouragement is? Take it to work. Take it to your neighbor. Use it as a tool. We take it out to a housing project. We go out with it there. We distribute it during the week when people knock our doors. We use this bread ministry to reach out to our neighbors. Some take it to work, to their co-workers. It's an opportunity. We have a ministry, a food pantry called Five and Two that's just ministering to families in need. We have a new life clothing closet where we have two rooms full of clothes donated by the people in our church. And people come, we open it up once a month and have the community come. Sometimes we'll have as many as 30 to 40 families that'll come there and get clothes out of that closet. And we seek to minister to those people when they come. We do a Thanksgiving meal, a community outreach through that where we invite people at Thanksgiving. We do, this year we did the Christmas meal boxes where we went out to families that were in need and gave them a whole Christmas meal in a box. We do a 4th of July fest where we had four to 500 people come. That was our first time last year, reaching out to the community. 
sharing the gospel there. We go into the rescue mission that is local to our zone, a drug and alcohol place, and we do a Bible study there for the men. We have a brother in the church that goes to the Bethesda house and reaches out to the 50 or 60 homeless people that come in there to sleep every night. And so we've, we're trying to get outside the walls. And that's what we're all called to do. Think of yourself as an individual missionary. We've been to Oklahoma, we've been to Jacksonville doing relief effort, and we're involved in foreign missions. We're involved, we have two missionary families that we support, one in Nigeria, one in Honduras currently. And so that's what God has given us to do right now. But within that, God has individual missions work for you individually outside of the church. Wherever you work, wherever you go to school, whatever you're doing, that's your mission. It's your Jerusalem. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. But whenever you read scripture where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, Always keep in mind that he is speaking to you also. Don't just say, well, yeah, that was good for the disciples. This is for all of us to see. In other words, you need to personalize this as I read it. It says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. You might want to underline that. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men? Verse 14. You are the light of the world. I want you to put your name in there. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to look at three things out of these four verses. You are salt, you are light, and let your light so shine before men. You're missionaries in your own right. God has called you, God has commissioned you to go out and make disciples, to be used of him. In God's eyes, I, I, this is the way I, I, I believe God sees it. Every child of God, every Christian is meant to be salt, the salt of this earth. Every one of us. Every Christian is meant to be the light of this world. That wasn't just for the disciples, it was for each one of us. And I think that we all need to be reminded of that daily, don't we? How about when you get up in the morning and you're having your devotion time and you're thinking about heading off to work and going about your day? Are you thinking about the fact that you are salt in this world? Are you thinking about the thought that you are a light in this world when you leave your house? It's important for us to remind ourselves that daily, to make that part of our prayer. Simply put, this scripture, these verses that we read, it says that, uh, that we're salt, and the characteristic of salt is saltiness. And the purpose of light is to give light. Simple. My prayer, and for this conference and for my own heart, for my own self, is that God would stir our hearts. It stirs us afresh. You know what it means to be stirred, don't you? Holy Spirit just kind of stirring you up again, kind of feeling a little bit, you know, out of it, not really. But God, would you stir us up 
with a strong confidence in our heart that you want to use me. Yeah, me. You want to use me. I believe that our primary motive, it was said last night by Pastor Billy, talking about our motive for missions. And I, and, and I really believe that, and I'm going to add something a little bit to, to what Billy shared last night. I believe that our primary motive, the thing that should cause us to get out of bed every day and do anything for the Lord is our love for God. Our love for God. How about if I said it's our obedience to God? Well, a lot of things God says that he wants us to be obedient to. Do you always do it? No. How about when your heart is overwhelmed with a love for God? You desire to be obedient to the Lord, don't you? And, and so I, I'm going to say that I, our primary motive for missions, for evangelism, for being used of God in anything is our love for him and our concern for God's glory. Whatever you do in word and deed, do all what? To the glory of God. And then the second thing is, is that we would have a concern for our fellow human beings that are lost. That's secondary. A concern for them and where they're going to go when they, they die, if they have Christ or not. Evangelism and discipleship and missions. I believe they're, they're always best done when it's coming from a heart of overflow. Uh, I've seen people in my own church overflowing. And I've seen those that are barely getting themselves into the church building. But the ones that are overflowing, you can see it in their countenance. You can see it and just, man, they're, they're just like they're bottled up and they want to get it out. That's what God wants to do in all of us. He wants it to be an overflow of him. Him and you, you falling in love more and more with the Lord falling more and more in love with his word, hungering and thirsting after righteousness in your life. And it's an overflow. God, what would you have me to do? Isaiah, you know, Lord, send me. What place do we have to get to to make that kind of a statement? Lord, would you send me? I don't know where, but would you send me? It's overflow. How many of you have had the privilege of leading a person to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand, personally. Wow, that's good, quite a few. Quite a few in this room. Did you look around? Raise them again. Quite a few. There's nothing that is more exciting than to lead a person to Christ. I've been a pastor for a lot of years. Most exciting thing for me is to have an opportunity to lead a person to Christ. We had that opportunity actually outside the walls a couple weeks ago. It's the most exciting thing. So I was raised in a Christian home. Went to church from a baby up. I have parents today, one that's 83, the other one that's 87 years old. My mom just had knee replacement surgery this last week, or this week, and I was in the hospital on Thursday with her, and my dad comes up to me and he says, can you get, got any more of those church invite cards, because I'm running out of them. <laughs> Here she is in three days with a recoup in the hospital there. Here's my dad asking me for more cards, because he's running out of them. Where's your mission field? You know, you need replacement. Oh, God's got us on a three-day mission here at the hospital. <laughs> you know, knee replacement. Lord, use us. Give me opportunity. Not too hard for any one of us, is it? If you have the mindset. If you have a missionary lifestyle that you take on. 
pretty incredible. I had parents that were a great example for me. And, and they were always evangelistic. With neighbors, they were never missionaries over in the field. They were just neighbors, anyway. I mean, I saw it. That was them. Parents, you have a responsibility for your children. Let them see that you have a missionary mindset and lifestyle. Lead by example. I'm privileged. I've got all three of my daughters. My wife, Kathy, and my three daughters somewhere in this room, I believe, are all here. Yeah, there they are, all sitting together. And they've been in six years. They've been to the mission field with us in Wales. I've taken them out street witnessing. They know that for years and years that I would go out and do one-on-one -on -one evangelism. They have taken them out with me into the battle. And that's a good thing to do. We have families that take their children, right here, some of them, take them into the housing project that we go into. Taking your kids into the battle. Letting them experience what you experience as their parents. How many of you have been a Christian five years, 10 years, 20 years, and for any length of time at all, and, and you came to realize, you know, I've been a Christian a long time. And I, when, I, when I remember back uh, those days that I received Christ, I couldn't help but open my mouth for the Lord. But it's not like that anymore. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm real happy to get to a Bible study. But Christianity is so much more than that. I'm not minimizing Bible study by any means. But it's about getting this world, get, getting out to this world and, and, and getting the gospel out to this world. It's what we do when we leave the church, when we leave the Bible study. I had an opportunity years ago in a large paper company to host a Bible study at work. Anybody here hosting a Bible study at work? Raise your hand. One, two, a couple people, three, three people hosting a Bible study at work. Great opportunity, great mission field. People start realizing you're a Christian. You're making a note. Yeah, we meet over in the credit union over here and we have a Bible study. You start letting people know around the office. This was a large office. Here I am leading once. I, I never even taught the Bible. I didn't know anything else. I just said, God, okay, you know, I'll prepare a Bible study. It started opening up doors at the place of business that I worked at. I'd get up in the morning and I'd just be anticipating, praying and saying, God, would you open up a door for me? today at work. It was my mission field and I knew it. I remember one day sitting at my desk. I was on an order desk with 15 other women. And there was one man there and that was me. I heard a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? I heard a lot of stuff. And one day I was sitting there with my Bible on my desk, having my lunch. Everybody else was gone, except two women that were sitting there at their desk, and they were going on and on about how it's just so hard to find a good man. I mean, they're, they're, they're all a bunch of, you know, they, they're just going on and on and on. I'm just sitting there having my lunch. And inside, I'm getting stirred up. I'm hearing all this. They're not even being quiet about it. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to say something. And, and, and I finally did after I sat there and wrestled with it for a moment. And I said, can I say something? You know, they're all over the other side. Can I say something? Yeah. You know, and this is what I said. I, I said, you know what? This is what I've come to, to, to know. That if you ladies were to find a man that loves God with all of his heart, soul, and mind, you're going to find a man that's going to love you and a man that, you know, 
You should have seen how that looked right at that moment. (laughs) But I felt stirred inside to want to say something. We're salt. In a dying world, a decaying world, we're salt. We bring life. We bring hope to people in situations like that. One day I had a couple of people. I was in the sample department at this paper company. Had a couple people that started up a conversation on homosexuality. They knew I was a Christian. I just happened to be standing there working with them. They know I'm a Christian. Hey, Greg, what do you think about this? And, you know, right in my mind, here we go. You know, I said, well, what I did say to them, we can't talk now, but at lunchtime, let's get together and I'll give you my opinion on that. And you know what I did? I went and I went to Romans chapter 1 and I talked about this much on homosexuality, that much. All I did is read the scripture. You know what I did for the rest of the lunchtime? Shared the gospel with them. This is why we have that issue. This is why we're in the place. And I led into sharing the gospel with these two. An open door, divine appointment, looking for those opportunities that God puts before you. We're salt, we're light in this world. And this team that goes out from our church, I, I, I've been out with them a number of times and I, I started thinking about this salt and light and, and I think they're like a bunch of salt shakers. <laughs> bunch of salt shakers walking around through the projects just sprinkling salt. I mean, this place is a depressed area. This is a place where guns go off, drug deals are made. It's a very dark area of Winston-Salem that they go into. The, uh, some of our kids are going in there with them. Pray for them. But God is using, I look in their countenance when I've been out with them. I see their countenance. I see their faces as they're walking around. This person over here praying with this person. This person over here sharing. These people over here playing with the kids that are there. We're salt. We're hope. We're just getting outside the walls, getting around people. And if you're that salt and you're like, they're not, they're going to be drawn to you. We took Christmas boxes into that housing project with a meal inside. We did a birthday party out in front of the house, put on a whole birthday party and gave a gift to one of the kids living in there for all to see, not to our glory, to God's glory. Salt, light, get out amongst them. Jesus said in verse 14, he says, you're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Cannot. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. So what's happening when we go out to the projects is what happens when you go out to your workplace. If you're shining like light, if you're salt for the Lord, it's what you're going to be. People are going to look at you. And when those opportunities come, they're going to listen to you because you're unashamed of your faith. You're trying to hide it. How I started that Bible study at that paper company, it was from this simple little thing. I happened that day, I just started the job. This was the first week I was there. I wore a a tie and I had a Christian tie clip that looked like one of those little fishes. Lady walks up to the drinking fountain, sees that tie clip and says, you Christian? I said, yeah, I'm a Christian. we're We're gonna start a Bible study here this week. You wanna come along? I said, sure. I go in there, there's about eight people sitting in the credit union there, office, they were going to let us use it, and they were all sitting in their chair, and they said, so who's going to lead it? <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, I left another paper coming to take this position, and that's really where my Bible study started, and you know what was happening in my heart? It was going like this, because that was the only reason I didn't want to leave the other place. Because God gave me an opportunity to lead a Bible study there. Here I'm going like this. and going, I could do it. You got it. And then the Bible study began. 
little Christian fish on the, that was all. We're light, we're salt in this world. We're, re, we're, we're reflectors of him. We're not the light. He's the light. Jesus is the light. You're just a reflector of him, a reflector of his glory. But if salt has lost its flavor, you know, if you're trying to hide, there's no hidden Christians. You know, the best thing to do when you start a new job, blaze in there from day one. Let them know right off from day one. Get the ball rolling. You know, the worst thing that could ever be said about you as a Christian, worst thing, is that you've worked there for five years and then you run into a Christian that's on fire and you say, I'm a Christian too. Really? I've been working with you for five years and I didn't know you were a Christian? It's the worst thing that could ever be said. Just get the ball rolling right off. Our Christian faith was never intended to be hidden. It's what Jesus told his disciples. In context, when Jesus said, you know, to his disciples, you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father, which is in heaven also. We hear that at altar calls quite often. But the context is to his disciples as he's going to send them out that don't deny me. There's no hidden Christians. We're all to be light, to salt, be salt to this world. I had an opportunity as a young boy to go up to the mountains camping with my parents. They took us to a place called Crystal Cave Caverns in California. Anybody been there? Yeah. Somebody? Hey, there we go. Crystal Cave. I'll see if they did this with you. The ranger took us on a tour of the cave system, took us into this large room within the cave. And he says, I want you to all stand still. And we did. They had the light bulbs going in that cavern. He reached down by his leg and he says, I'm going to turn off the lights for a moment. And he did. And it was utter darkness. You ever been in that? Uh, utter, if we turned all the lights off in here, you'd still have light coming through there. If you turned all the lights and you blackened those windows out, you'd still have a little bit of light coming through that doorway. It's hard if you've, never, if you've been in complete, utter darkness. You can put your hand up to your face like that. You can't even see any outline. Did they do that with you? Ca Crystal Cavern? She didn't hear me. <laughs> They did. <laughs> Pretty incredible. It's an eerie feeling. It's what this world lives in. Decay, darkness. He's telling his disciples, your light, your light in a dark world. And you know what? It doesn't take much. You know what that ranger did? He took one match and lit it, a single match. This cavern was two to three times the size of this room. One little match in that utter darkness, and held it up like that. And you know where that light went? It went through the whole cavern. One match stick holding it like that. That light traveled through the whole cavern and lit up that whole room. How much light does it take to dispel darkness? How much light in your life as an individual Christian, when you come into your workplace, when you go to school, when you're out, does it take to bring hope, to bring something to those people that you're around? You may not see it, but they see it. And if you're unashamed of your faith, believe me, they see it. And not everyone will want it. But there will be some that do, some that want it. Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.8, For you were once darkness. Did you know that? 
You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Once darkness, now you're light in the Lord. It's not your light. You're a reflection of him. When Jesus came into the world, it was very dark, wasn't it? Very sinful, dark, and he was going to be rejected by this dark world. But we're told that there was a man that was sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him through Jesus might believe. John was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. In 1 John 1, 5, we read this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with God and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. We're just all these walking lights, salt in a world. That's how God views you. Is that just that instrument that he can use? In 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims that you would abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe... Glorify God in the day of visitation. Isn't that incredible? That anybody could even glorify God by looking at my life. That you could be such a different kind of a person than what they typically know. That they would have to say in their mind, there's got to be something to this God. I knew you before. I knew how you were. And look what you have become. You're different. It's incredible. It's a miracle of God. We're all walking miracles, aren't we? Jesus says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's just, it's hard to wrap our head around that. How, how God could use this earthen vessel and what are these good works? What are the things that people might see? Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, he says, but if, even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. When people see you, what they're seeing is Christ. They're not, there's not enough good in me, believe me that anybody's just going to get all worked up and just want God because of me. It's what they see in us. It's the fruit of God's Holy Spirit. It's God working through you in a supernatural way. We're these reflectors for God. The people would see your good works. That it would be reflective of your Father which is in heaven. And that's all we want to do is bring glory, Him glory. 
Not glory to ourselves. Oh, yeah, we have a good church go around. No, that we don't want people to see us. We want them to see God in us. Paul in Philippians chapter 2, he says that your character as a Christian is important. You need to shine for him. Your life needs to shine with a godly character. Uh, We're salt and we're light. What does that mean? What does that look like? Practically speaking, what does that look like? Therefore, my beloved Christians, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, Christians, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Shining for Christ. How does this light shine through us? How is it seen in you or not seen in you as a Christian? I believe that it starts with a purity of heart. A purity of heart. God's the only one that can change your hearts. You submit to him and say, God, would you change me? See if there be any wicked way in me. Bring it to my attention. Let me deal with it. Let your Holy Spirit have its way in me. And let God create that pure heart in you. Blessed are the pure in heart. Another way we could say it is blessed are the undivided in heart. You see, to have a divided heart means you've got one part of your heart in the world and one part trying to be a Christian. I've tried to do that. Have you? One and half and half. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, the ones that would give me their whole heart, every part of you. To me, the world will see it. They won't see it when you're divided. They will see it when you're pure in heart. They'll see the integrity of who you say you are as a Christian. In 1 John 1, verse 5, this is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. None. But we need to walk in that light, don't we? As he is in the light. We need to walk like in that purity of heart before the Lord. We also have that integrity, the purity of heart and also that integrity of your soul, the mind, everything that makes you up. You know what makes you up? Body, soul, and spirit. Everything within you, your mind, your soul, your spirit, every part of your being, that purity, that integrity of mind and spirit, it's essential for you to be shining brightly as a Christian, essential. You see, if, if, if your life is not lining up with it, you know, you know it's, not, it's not happening out there, people won't see the difference and they won't even know you're a Christian. Purity and integrity. You know the lamps that you see in the Bible times? You know, they got the little wick and they put the oil in there and you put the oil in and you got the wick that comes out and lays on the edge of it there. You know, the oil is always that symbol of the Holy Spirit. And that wick that sits inside of there, you know what they have to do with the wick? They've got to trim the wick. You know why they trim the wick? Is they have to trim it because it starts burning down. When they trim the wick, then it's, it, it starts getting brighter again. You know, you've got to put the oil in. You've got to trim the wick so that it continues to be bright enough to light the whole house. We read and. Galatians 5, verse 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Number one, did you know that love is the primary thing in that verse? The fruit of the Spirit is love. And every other part that comes out of that word love, all the rest of that fruit, it all comes out of that love. Primary one, love. 
Christians loving, God's love being manifested in their life. The fruit of the Spirit is love. What comes out of that love is joy. What comes out of that is peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You do that, you let God's Spirit control your life, and you're going to shine like a light. It's going to be evident to those around you. Why are you so different? Why don't you get so upset why, why when every other employee here is complaining and bitter and mad and you're not, they see it. Jesus, in the context, and I'll close with this, or I'm getting close to it anyway. <laughs> they said, right, at least these, yeah, right. In context, in Matthew 5, 16, Jesus gave his disciples a list of quality, of character qualities that should be part of what a Christian is. This is who we should be. Uh, Jesus saw this multitude. He went up on this mountain and he sat down with his disciples. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. He began to teach his disciples on that day. And he said to them, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, there it is, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now we come to our text. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor... How shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There it is. The wick. Your integrity. Who you are as a Christian. What separates you from every other human being in this world? When you give your life to Christ, your integrity is all you have who you are and how you behave and all of these characteristics. If you sat down, when I taught the sermon, it took me probably three studies to get through this. There's a lot there. That integrity, that purity of heart is what makes you be that salt and light. It's what, when they see that you're different, they may not read the Bible, but they'll read your life like a book. You've heard that. I will close with this. What time am I supposed to be done? Now? Yeah. Okay. I should have known that when I saw him standing right at the back. I see that. It's flashing. Here's something that you can, here's something that you can, uh, you can do. It's practical. Write out, maybe today, tomorrow, write out a personal mission statement. Write out your own personal mission statement. And write it out. Here's an example of what it might look. I wrote, 
I believe that it is the goal of every Christian to grow in spiritual maturity through obedience to the word of God and the indwelling spirit. Therefore, I believe that it is the obligation of the saved to witness by life and word to the truths of the scriptures and to seek to proclaim the gospel and to turn and make disciples of all nations. Write your own mission statement out of what you would like to see God do in you. Let's pray. (laughs) Father, we thank you for this time. God, would you bless our lunch? Would you bless our our rest of our time, the, the, the third teaching that's coming? God, would you work and instill these things that were said today? The first study, this study, Lord, instill them in our hearts. Let us meditate upon them even after today. That you might have your way in us, that you might be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.